Well, Merry Christmas. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Yeah. You know, thank God for the wonderful wet snow this week. You know, what is it about, what is it about snow that brings about the warmth of Christmas? You know, is it, is it because uh, we, 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 we're chastened from the frightfulness outside to the delight of a warm house with warm bodies to hold and to snuggle with? You know, it's nice to have a sanctuary from the cold and look at the beauty of it all from inside. You know, what is it about trials that brings warmth to the family of God. Say what? We live in a frightful world. And all over this world, Christians are being slaughtered for their faith in Christ. You know, you may have experienced some persecution yourself, you know, for being a Christian. You know, if you haven't experienced trials in your Christian walk, it's almost like not experiencing a white Christmas. The Bible says to count it all joy when you encounter trials and persecution. And it doesn't say if, it says when. Peter says, don't be surprised. Paul says, if, you, if a person that wants to live, live a godly life will be persecuted. I mean, it, Jesus even said, in this world you will have trouble. It's part of it. It's like part of the white Christmas. Did any of you ever pray for a white Christmas? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think as older folks did, we just got to remember. <laughs> Way back when. Did any of you ever pray for trials in the Christian life? Hmm. You know, as I look at uh, the persecution of the Christians in the Muslim world, I wonder if I will encounter that peace, that tranquility, that, that joy that these Christians seem to have. Uh, I uh, got a figure just for the month of November, 5,042 lives were lost as a result of these Muslim militants. More than 400 were killed by execution style, mostly in Iraq and Syria, and 50 of those died from beheading. Now this past week we look you know, we look at what happened to, to the Pakistan. And it's not only happened in Pakistan, it's happening in the free world. Sydney got hit. You know, if it comes here, and I'm saying if, not when, if it comes here, I wonder, will I have the comforts of Christmas inside as I look at the frightfulness outside? I wonder, will I view God's will as delightful? Please, let's turn to Luke 11. There's a contrast. You know, as we look at the prayer and follow the outline of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught His disciples, it starts out with comfort. The comforting words of our Father. Our Father, our, our, our Father figure, inside of each one of us, we have an ideal Father that's a protector, a giver, and, and a comforter. Why did Jesus, why did Christ command us to call God our Father? To awaken in us at the very beginning of our prayer, what should be basic to our prayer? A childlike reverence and trust that through Christ. God has become our Father. And that just as our parents do not refuse us the things of this life, even less will God our Father refuse to give us what we ask in faith. You know, sometimes some people have a real hard time, tough time listening to our Father and relating that to the Father in heaven. Because some of us haven't had the fathers that were good examples. I mean, our earthly fathers may not have <laughs> been, had a good reputation. 
Some of you may, may even suffered abuse from our earthly fathers. So it doesn't, the father doesn't have a comforting feeling to it. You know, and then, then if we, we look again at, at, at what's going around us, you know, the Muslim world, and, and we think of, hey, our Father's allowing this to happen. Sometimes we feel, hey, God, do you care? Father, do you care? You know, the Father could be absent. I was uh, listening to a story about these two kids, and uh, their father wasn't getting very far with them. They were really rebellious. And uh, their parents finally says, okay, well, we got to take him to the pastor. I mean, there's the last resort. We're going to take him to the pastor. And they live pretty close to the, to the church. So uh, the pastor talked with the parents and says, well, I'll, I'll see them one at a time. And so, so the, the first boy walks over to the pastor, knocked on the door in the church, you know, and the big doors open. He walks to the office and the pastor's sitting at his desk. And, and uh, the boy walks in and the pastor didn't look too happy, you know. You don't want to mess with these brats and uh, so he says sit down and he goes I have one question to ask of you he says where's God and the boy didn't answer he just you know wondering and the pastor says ask again where is God and this time the boy's eyes start getting big round and the pastor started making an impact so then he, he, he gets up and he's Stands up and he pounds on his desk. He says, where is God? And then the boy, I mean, he just, guys got real big and he got up out of his chair and he ran. He ran all the way home. He opened the door, slammed the front door in the room, opened the door, slammed the door and then ran into his closet and closed the door behind him there. His brother, I mean, he sees this all and he goes, whoa. He knocks on the door. He says, what happened? He goes, oh, we're in trouble now. We're in deep trouble now. God's missing. And they think we did it. <laughs> Is God the Father absent? Do you often ask, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, where is He? Where is he with these thousands that are losing their lives? Where is he even in my life when justice isn't served? Where's my father? When Jesus himself was on the cross, we hear a similar phrase. My God, my God, where, why have you forsaken me? Has the Father abandoned you? In Luke 11, where one version of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospels is, is it starts with verse 1, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me. And I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The, Lord, the door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him bread because he, he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? 
If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Please let's turn to Jeremiah 23, 23. You know, so many immature Christians focus on the package and not the wrapping. I mentioned last week uh, that one year we gave uh, Kat's mom wrapping for Christmas. I mean, it was, it, was, it was tradition that every time we opened a present, we had to open it really carefully so, so that we could give the nice unripped wrapping to, to Kat's mom. On this particular Christmas, we rebelled, okay? <laughs> when we got each package, I mean, it didn't matter how much coaxing mother-in-law gave. I mean, I took that present, I just ripped it open, you know, woohoo! Because I knew at the end of the day, last present open, it'd be, she would get all that brand new Christmas wrap. It's not the wrapping sometimes. But it's not the Father who has abandoned you. If he seems far away, you know, there's that phrase, who moved? You know, so many times people place a box around God. You know, this, this is the God I know. I mean, he, he, he's loving and, and he's all powerful. And then they, they, they box that in. They, they limit God to, to, to that. You know, forget about the justice and the wrath and, you know, all that other stuff that come by, that the Bible expresses. But we get, and then we get disappointed because we're just focusing on the wrapping, on the box that we've formed God to be. They turn God into the neatly wrapped package. You know, just, just look how, look how peaceful this, this nativity scene looks this morning. It just looks peaceful. It looks clean. You know, all the hay is clean and, and nice and smelly and, you know, hay smelly. But you know what? That first day in that, you know, there's a lot of animals. And animals are not always, you know... Uh, I have a, my, my grandson, Jason, he, has a, he, has, he, he can't handle smells very good. And uh, last uh, Thanksgiving, he came to uh, Sterling and I, for, for Thanksgiving, and, and Sterling just happened to have a smell located around there. And he says, man, it smells here. You know, who would live in a place like this? They need to move to Fort Collins. <laughs> but... But, it, you know, that stable, you know, it wasn't probably the best or, you know, what do you call it uh, when, you, when you have that uh, smelly stuff that makes you, what's that? Aroma. Aroma. Or more, it wasn't the best aromatherapy, all right? Here were Joseph and Mary with all their belongings. After a long trek, long trek, on foot, to deliver the king of kings in a stable. And within that smelly, exhausted, tore up, chaotic package was the salvation and the peace of earth. You know, you, you can't judge the gift by its package. You know, the more time you spend with the Father, the more He will clue you in on the gift that He wants to bestow on you. And He prepared for you in advance. You know, what's the request in that passage that we just read out of, out of Luke 11? What was the request? How much more will the Father give to you the... It was the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Now he clues us in. This is what I want to give you. It's awesome. This is the best gift I can give you. And he says, how much more will the Holy Spirit be given? Will, will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those <coughs> who ask him? <clears throat> it wasn't bread, fish, clothing, shelter, health, or wealth. It was the Holy Spirit. You know, that other, step, that other stuff, it's just the wrapping. It, it's just the packaging. Don't get the gift 
mixed up with the wrapping. Don't try to package this unfathomable God and try to unwrap him to enjoy the world. Are you following me? Why the words in heaven? These words teach us not to think of God's heavenly majesty as something earthly and to expect everything needed for the body and the soul from God's almighty power. You know, recognizing God as Father in heaven, first of all, should break connection with the fathers who on this earth are evil. What? What? Well, Jesus said it. Jesus said the fathers on this earth were evil. And in that same passage, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, recognizing God as Father in heaven, you know, does not mean that he's absent from us. Whoa, he's way up in heaven. He's way up there. That's why I feel so all alone and so abandoned. No, he's also near us too. Uh, prayer is communicating directly with him. I mean, he's right there. Um, it's also an agreement with him for his terms, how to live your life. In Jeremiah 23, starting with verse 23, it says, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusion of their minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Please, let's turn to Hebrews 12, 2. You know, the, the, the prophet, prophets that Jeremiah judged moved from God. They were distanced from God. They, they basically were saying, oh, he's way up in heaven. I can do what I want. I can say what I want about him and, and, and no, nothing's going to happen to me. They didn't take the opportunity to know God. Instead, they dreamed him up. They boxed him in their neatly formed ideas and, and taped over his words and, and wrapped it all pretty with a, with a nice little label. This is what we want. This is, this is, this is, declares the Lord. You know, prayer is not directing God to your will. God, this is the way I want my life to go. Make it happen. No. It's directing our will to his will. It's ripping off the label of God and tearing away the neat wrapping and opening the box that that limited God to your understanding. He is your Father in heaven. So we earthly people have a limited view of our understanding of Him. You know, even Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. When at the last minute He he desired another way besides the cup of suffering that he knew was, was destined for him. For another way for him to be able to save the world. Last minute. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, he said. There was no other way than to destroy his own life. To open up that gift of salvation for you. You know, Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes at his birth. The package Jesus was to open was suffering on the cross. You know, after the cross, he donned on that familiar packaging again. 
they wrapped him again in those familiar cloths and they laid him in a tomb. But the thing is, that wrapping wasn't meant to stay on. You know, it's like those Christmas wrapping. You know, when you wrap that present and you, you tie it all and, and put it so neatly, that Christmas wrapping was meant to rip off. That's exactly what that packaging was for. And when Jesus was wrapped in that, those, I mean, they, they even put lots of perfume in there. I think it was about 75 pounds of perfume mixed with all that wrapping when they laid him in that tomb. I mean, they, they, they took care in wrapping the Lord Jesus Christ, that package. But it wasn't the packaging that was important. It was what was beyond when that packaging ripped off. Because we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. The resurrection. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give gift, good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Focus on the gift. The package is to be unwrapped. During our last Buccaneers uh, party, Christmas party, we had this pinata. And I tell you what, I think I put too much tape on it. Uh, we, we, we went where all the kids hit that thing twice or three times with blindfolds, okay? And there was 30 kids. Every one of those, that's, that's 90 hits on that thing, man. <laughs> and we said, okay, no blindfold. Everybody gets one hit, you know? And pretty soon we had to get the last, the last girl. We, we said, okay, we're going to rip some of that tape off. <laughs> I had to tape the... And then, okay, we, we, we even took something, in, uh, a, a knife, and, and, and kind of opened it up, and then pretty soon it's just one more hit, and poof, all that pinata came out. But you know, you know what, what happens with that pinata to, 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 so, so it can lose all that precious cargo? It gets smacked. I mean, it doesn't just get ripped open by little... I mean, it gets beat up. Maybe you feel like a pinata. You know, Jesus certainly did. Jesus knew what was inside. There was a joy behind all that agony. Jesus was focused on the gift, not the package. And may you as well. In Hebrews 12, starting with verse 2, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's the, that's, that's the gift. That's, that's behind all that suffering and persecution for us. But this is how he lived. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes as everyone he accept, accepts as a son. Endure hardship as a disciple. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have had, all had human fathers, earthly fathers. We have a heavenly father. We have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Please, let's turn to Romans 8, 28. Merry Christmas! You have a Father in heaven. A Father that loves you. you know, the time is now to start ripping into that package. Woohoo! Start enjoying, you know, uh, dreaming of, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. I'm dreaming of a persecuted Christian life. Something like that. Woohoo! Uh, who for the joy set before you endure your cross so that you 
can anticipate with joy. Not the tearing apart of your package or, or the diminishing of your body or your reputation or whatever, your, your things. But as that stuff peels off, you start seeing what the package that God is forming. And really, it's the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's the gift. You know, the world focuses on the wrapping. You know, this deteriorating body, these, these clothes that get moth-eaten, and equipment that breaks down, riches that corrode and get stolen, food that spoils. The Lord knows that you have need of these things, so, so turn your focus on the gift. Set your heart on the prize. Seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. And God will take care of the packaging, you know, whatever that packaging is. But He has a gift for you. And that gift is great. It's, it's full of glory. You know, like little children, joyfully tear through the wrapping and open the gift. And we are children of the Father. Are you ready for Christmas? <laughs> yeah. Okay, how many of you are enjoying the beautifully wrapped, growing pile of packages underneath the tree? Okay. Maybe you have to think back a little ways. <laughs> Soon all that wrapping is going to be torn off. <laughs> Soon all that it's going to be tore off. The tree and all the decorations, they're all going to be put away. The tree is going to be put away. You know, when you look at your life, it's easy to focus on the pretty wrapping. This world is full of majesty and beauty. It is. It's a beautiful world. With beautiful feelings, beautiful, beautiful love, beautiful relationships. I mean, it's all there. But someday, this world is going to pass away. Someday, in the Bible even says it's going to be folded up like a garment. But there's something that's not going to be taken away. And that's your relationship with the Father. The Heavenly Father hung a wonderful gift not that tree, but on the cross. The first Christmas tree. And the first Christmas ornament. Start unwrapping. It may seem like a lot of layers to rip and tear, but one thing is for sure, that this truly is the gift that keeps on giving. May you, for the joy set before you, endure your cross. In Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He pre-planned, He predestined, He also predestined to what? Be conformed to the likeness of His Son. Okay, as, that, as, those, as you start tearing into the, your package, start seeing and re, seeing the revelation of the likeness of His Son in your life. That He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? As you rip into the dying nature of this world and the flesh, one layer at a time, you'll start seeing that wonderful gift God has prepared for you to endure through all eternity. You being conformed to the likeness of Christ, His Son. And as you're identified with the Son, you become identified with His Father. Let's pray.